Today is day one for the Come Follow Me study for this week, October 28th through November 3rd. I would that I could persuade all to repent. Mormon 1 through 6. Monday, October 28th, 2024. Mormon 1. Help others share what they learn. When people share what they've learned, they strengthen their own faith and the faith of others. Try asking your family or class what experiences they had as they studied God's word. Having summarized accounts of the Lord's visit among the Nephites and the 200-year era of peace that followed, Mormon reported that starting in the 201st year, pride, disunity, and wickedness took over. In the Book of Mormon, we read of events where he was an eyewitness. These events include the demise of the Nephite civilization. Time after time through the centuries, the Lamanites, sometimes aided by dissenting Nephites, clashed with their Nephite brethren. And time after time, the Lamanites could not prevail for longer than a few years. Why? Certainly, it was not lack of manpower, for the Lamanites usually outnumbered the Nephites. It could not have been lack of military prowess or bravery, for the Lamanites seemed to have been able and courageous fighters. And even when the Nephites became so wicked that they destroyed their own social system and lapsed into such a state of anarchy that it was impossible to repel an organized foe, the Lord sent great destruction upon them but saved the more righteous part of the people to see the resurrected Christ. The only explanation for the continuing survival of Nephite society was the Lord's intervention because of their prayers and repentance. But then why, after all that time, did the Lord cease to intervene from about A.D. on? Why did he not only cease to intervene, but also to completely withdraw his spirit from both camps, leaving them to sink to depths of depravity without parallel in their history? The answer, of course, lies in their behavior. The Lord is always perfectly consistent. He doesn't save one group in spite of their wickedness and destroy another because of it. After the Nephites had enjoyed a Zion society for nearly 200 years, their return to weakness signaled total rebellion against the Lord. Gradually, the whole society turned to wickedness and the spirit began to withdraw. This time, there were not enough righteous people to save the society. As you study this period of Nephite history, watch for the signs of this final decay, for in it there are many clues of great value for us today. In Mormon 1-6, through we can empathize with Mormon sorrow over the destruction of his people, the destruction which came upon them because of their rejection of the Lord and his gospel. We can also resolve to avoid such calamity in our own lives. Mormon spared us the full account of the awful scene of wickedness and bloodshed that he saw among the Nephites. But what he did record in Mormon 1-6 through is enough to remind us how far people who were once righteous can fall. Amid such pervasive wickedness, no one can blame Mormon for becoming weary and even discouraged, yet through all that he saw and experienced, he never lost his sense of God's great mercy and his conviction that repentance is the way to receive it. And although Mormon's own people rejected his pleading invitations to repent, he knew that he had a larger audience to persuade. Behold, he declared, I write unto all the ends of the earth. In other words, he wrote to you. And his message to you today is the same message that could have saved the Nephites in their day. Believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Repent and prepare to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. These chapters repeat the message that prevails throughout the Book of Mormon. There is no weapon that can prevail against the righteous except their own unrighteousness. The Book of Mormon, Chapter 1 Amoron instructs Mormon concerning the sacred records. War commences between the Nephites and the Lamanites. The three Nephites are taken away. Wickedness, unbelief, sorceries, and witchcraft prevail. About 321 to 326 A.D. Amoron prepares Mormon to receive the sacred records. Because Mormon was quite young when he developed his faith in Christ, he can be an inspiration to your children. Perhaps you could read Mormon 1, 1 through 3, and your children could listen for how old Mormon was when Amaron gave him a special mission. You could also help them find in these verses the qualities that Amaron saw in Mormon. Mormon 1, 1. And now I, Mormon, make a record of the things which I have both seen and heard, and call it the Book of Mormon. In an effort to correct an error in relation to the word Mormon, the prophet Joseph Smith wrote the following letter to the editor of the Times and Seasons, an early church publication. Sir, 
through the medium of your paper, I wish to correct an error among men that profess to be learned, liberal, and wise. And I do it the most cheerfully because I hope sober thinking and sound reasoning people will sooner listen to the voice of truth than to be led astray by the vain pretensions of the self-wise. The error I speak of is the definition of the word Mormon. It has been stated that this word was derived from the Greek word mormo, which is not the case. There was no Greek or Latin upon the plates from which I, through the grace of the Lord, translated the Book of Mormon. Let the language of the book speak for itself. On the 523rd page of the fourth edition, which is Mormon 9, 32 and 33, it reads, And now behold, we have written this record according to our knowledge in the characters which are called among us the Reformed Egyptian, being handed down and altered by us according to our manner of speech, and if our plates had been sufficiently large, we would have written in Hebrew. But the Hebrew hath been altered by us also. And if we could have written in Hebrew, behold, ye would have had no imperfection in our record. But the Lord knoweth the things which we have written, and also that none other people knoweth the things which we have written, and also that none other people knoweth our language. Therefore he hath prepared means for the interpretation thereof. Here then the subject is put to silence, for none other people knoweth our language. Therefore, the Lord, and not man, had to interpret. After the people were all dead, and as Paul said, the world by wisdom know not God. So the world by speculation are destitute of revelation. And as God in his superior wisdom has always given his saints, wherever he had any on the earth, the same spirit, and that spirit, as John says, is the true spirit of prophecy, which is the testimony of Jesus. I may safely say that the word Mormon stands independent of the wisdom and learning of this generation. The word Mormon means literally more good. In an overview of Mormon's life, President Gordon B. Hinckley referred to the meaning associated with Mormon's name, a name that has become a reference to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. May I remind you for a moment of the greatness and of the goodness of this man Mormon. He lived on the American continent in the 4th century after Christ. When Mormon was a boy of 10, the historian of the people, whose name was Amaron, described him as a sober child and quick to observe. Amaron gave him a charge that when he reached the age of 24, he was to take custody of the records of the generations who had preceded him. The years that followed Mormon's childhood were years of terrible bloodshed for his nation, the result of a long and vicious and terrible war between those who were called Nephites, and those who were called Lamanites. Mormon later became the leader of the armies of the Nephites and witnessed the carnage of his people, making it plain to them that their repeated defeats came because they forsook the Lord, and he in turn abandoned them. He wrote of our generation with words of warning and pleading, proclaiming with eloquence his testimony of the resurrected Christ. He warned of calamities to come if we should forsake the ways of the Lord, as his own people had done knowing that his own life would soon be brought to an end. As his enemies hunted the survivors, he pleaded for our generation to walk with faith, hope, and charity, declaring charity is the pure love of Christ, and it endureth forever, and whoso is found possessed of it in the last day, it shall be well with him. Such was the goodness, the strength, the power, the faith, the prophetic heart of the prophet leader Mormon. By the time he was only about 10 years old, Mormon was remarkably different from the people around him. As you read Mormon 1-6, through 6, look for ways that Mormon's faith in Jesus Christ made him unique and gave him opportunities to serve and bless others. The following verses might get you started. Mormon 1-2 And about the time that Amaron hid up the records unto the Lord, he came unto me, I being about 10 years of age, and I began to be learned somewhat after the manner of the learning of my people. And Amaron said unto me, I perceive that thou art a sober child, and art quick to observe. Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles said, When we are quick to observe, we promptly look or notice and obey. Both of these fundamental elements, looking and obeying, are essential to being quick to observe, and the prophet Mormon is an impressive example of this gift in action. Mormon 1.3 Therefore, when ye are about twenty and four years old, I would that ye should remember the things that ye have observed concerning this people. And when ye are of that age, go to the land Antum, unto a hill that shall be called Shem, and there have I deposited unto the Lord all the sacred engravings concerning this people. 
How do these qualities help us follow Jesus Christ? Because Mormon followed Jesus Christ, he was given opportunities to serve and bless others. Mormon 1, 4-7 And behold, ye shall take the plates of Nephi unto yourself, and the remainder shall ye leave in the place where they are. And ye shall engrave on the plates of Nephi all the things that ye have observed concerning this people. And I, Mormon, being a descendant of Nephi, and my father's name was Mormon, I remembered the things which Amaron commanded me. And it came to pass that I, being eleven years old, was carried by my father into the land southward, even to the land of Zarahemla. The whole face of the land had become covered with buildings, and the people were as numerous, almost as it were, the sand of the sea. Bloodshed among the warring Nephites and Lamanites. Mormon 1, 8-12 and it came to pass, in this year there began to be a war between the Nephites, who consisted of the Nephites and the Jacobites and the Josephites and the Zoramites. And this war was between the Nephites and the Lamanites and the Lemuelites and the Ishmaelites. Now the Lamanites and the Lemuelites and the Ishmaelites were called Lamanites, and the two parties were Nephites and Lamanites. And it came to pass that the war began to be among them in the borders of Zarahemla, by the waters of Sidon. And it came to pass that the Nephites had gathered together a great number of men, even to exceed the number of thirty thousand. And it came to pass that they did have in this same year a number of battles, in which the Nephites did beat the Lamanites and did slay many of them. And it came to pass that the Lamanites withdrew their design, and there was peace settled in the land, and peace did remain for the space of about four years, that there was no bloodshed. Spiritual darkness results from Nephite wickedness. Mormon 1, 13-14 But wickedness did prevail upon the face of the whole land, insomuch that the Lord did take away his beloved disciples, and the work of miracles and of healing did cease because of the iniquity of the people. And there were no gifts from the Lord, and the Holy Ghost did not come upon any because of their wickedness and unbelief. In detailing the commencement of the wars that led to the downfall of the Nephite nation, what did Mormon write about the spiritual condition of the Nephites and Lamanites? Moroni 7. Have angels ceased to appear unto the children of men? Or has he withheld the power of the Holy Ghost from them? If these things have ceased, woe be unto the children of men, for it is because of unbelief, and all is vain. Then has faith ceased also, and awful is the state of man. Elder Erastus Snow said, If our spirits are inclined to be stiff and refractory, and we desire continually the gratification of our own will, to the extent that this feeling prevails in us, the Spirit of the Lord is held at a distance from us, or in other words, the Father withholds His Spirit from us in proportion as we desire the gratification of our own will. The Prophet Joseph Smith said, Have not the pride, high-mindedness, and unbelief of the Gentiles provoked the Holy One of Israel to withdraw His Holy Spirit from them, and sent forth His judgments to scourge them for their wickedness? This is certainly the case. The Lord declared to his servants some 18 months since the church was organized that he was then withdrawing his spirit from the earth. And we can see that such is the fact. For not only the churches are dwindling away, but there are no conversions, or but very few. And this is not all. The governments of the earth are thrown into confusion and division, and destruction to the eye of the spiritual beholder seems to be written by the finger of an invisible hand in large capitals, upon almost everything we behold. Mormon 1, 15. And I, being fifteen years of age, and being somewhat of a sober mind, therefore I was visited of the Lord, and tasted and knew of the goodness of Jesus. I, Mormon, make a record of the things which I have both seen and heard, and call it the Book of Mormon. Now, both the people of Nephi and the Lamanites had become exceedingly wicked, one like unto another. Get out of the way, boy! Amaron, who kept the record of the 
people of Nephi, being constrained by the Holy Ghost, did hide up the records unto the Lord, that they might come again unto the remnant of the house of Jacob. I, being about ten years of age, began to be learned somewhat after the manner of my people. Kingdom? Kingdom. Come again unto them. Mormon, Amron is here to see you. I perceive that thou art a sober child quick to observe. When ye are about twenty and four years old, go to the land Antum, unto a hill that shall be called Shim. And there I have deposited unto the Lord all the sacred engravings concerning this people. Ye shall take the plates of Nephi and engrave all the things that ye have observed. And I, Mormon, remembered the things which Amaron commanded me. My beloved Lord. And when I was fifteen years of age, and being somewhat of a sober mind, I was visited of the Lord, and tasted and knew of the goodness of Jesus. What do you think it means to be of a sober mind? Sober can mean reverent, serious, or thoughtful. Read the following statement by President Boyd K. Packer of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. We have watched patterns of reverence and irreverence in the church. While many are to be highly commended, we are drifting. We have reason to be deeply concerned. Irreverence suits the purpose of the adversary by obstructing the delicate channel of revelation in both mind and spirit. Mormon writes in his record the following brief statement concerning one of the greatest events in his life, being 15 years of age and being somewhat of a sober mind. Therefore, I was visited of the Lord and tasted and knew of the goodness of Jesus. This statement indicates that he was evidently the recipient of a personal visitation by the Savior. Though Mormon gives us no clue that his parents were righteous, we do know that he grew up in a time of great wickedness in his society. Yet he remained pure enough that as a youth, he could receive a visitation from the Savior. Such an example should inspire present youth who also must live in times of great wickedness, but who can rise above it, even at an early age. Mormon 116, And I did endeavor to preach unto this people, but my mouth was shut, and I was forbidden that I should preach unto them. For behold, they had willfully rebelled against their God. And the beloved disciples were taken away out of the land because of their iniquity. Many evils followed in the wake of evil choices. When people reach a certain level of wickedness and are determined to reject his living prophets, God does not allow the prophets to minister to the people. In modern times, the Lord suggested that if his people were faithful, he would bless them with commandments. Often in our foolishness, we think commandments are a burden rather than a blessing. Yet, through the commandments, we are shown the only way to joy and peace. To have a great prophet in their midst, and yet have the Lord not follow him, to bless them by giving them commandments, was a great tragedy for the Nephites. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles contrasted the spiritual maturity of Mormon with the sinful state of Mormon's people. In spite of Mormon's righteous desire, he was forbidden to preach because of the rebellious condition of his people. The maturing Mormon, by then 15 years of age, stood beyond the sinfulness around him and rose above the despair of his time. Consequently, he was visited of the Lord and tasted and knew of the goodness of Jesus, trying valiantly to preach to his people. But as God occasionally does when those with so much light reject it, Mormon literally had his mouth shut. 
he was forbidden to preach to a nation that had willfully rebelled against their God. These people have rejected the miracles and messages delivered them by the three translated Nephite disciples, who had now also been silenced in their ministry and been taken from the nation to whom they had been sent. While serving as a member of the Seventy, Elder Dean L. Larson explained that rebellion against God has individual roots which, if not corrected, spread with devastating consequences. Historically, the drifting away from the course of life marked out by the Lord has occurred as individuals begin to make compromises with the Lord's standard. This is particularly true when the transgression is willful and no repentance occurs. Remember Mormon's description of those who turned away from the true path in his day. They did not sin in ignorance. They willfully rebelled against God. It did not occur as a universal movement, but began as individual members of the church knowingly began to make compromises with the Lord's standard. They sought justification for their diversions in the knowledge that others were compromising as well. Those who willfully sin soon seek to establish a standard of their own, with which they can feel more comfortable and which justifies their misconduct. They also seek the association of those who are willing to drift with them along this path of self-delusion. As the number of drifting individuals increases, their influence becomes more powerful. It might be described as the great and spacious building syndrome. The drifting is the more dangerous when its adherents continue to overtly identify with and participate with the group that conforms with the Lord's way. Values and standards that were once clear become clouded and uncertain. The norm of behavior begins to reflect this beclouding of true principles. Conduct that would once have caused revulsion and alarm now becomes somewhat commonplace. Mormon 117. But I did remain with them, but I was forbidden to preach unto them because of the hardness of their hearts, and because of the hardness of their hearts, the land was cursed for their sake. While there are no miracles among the people as a whole during this time, there were righteous individuals, Mormon being one. This suggests that no environment can become so corrupt that a private individual cannot have the sweet influence of the Holy Ghost. Yet, this divine influence could not benefit those around Mormon because of the hardness of their hearts. What differences do you notice between Mormon and his people? What qualities did he have that helped him stay spiritually strong in such a difficult time? President Russell M. Nelson taught, true disciples of Jesus Christ are willing to stand out, speak up, and be different from the people of the world. They are undaunted, devoted, and courageous. There is nothing easy or automatic about becoming such powerful disciples. Our focus must be riveted on the Savior and his gospel. It is mentally rigorous to strive to look unto him in every thought. But when we do, our doubts and fears flee. Mormon 1, 18-19, And these Gadianton robbers who were among the Lamanites did infest the land, insomuch that the inhabitants thereof began to hide up their treasures in the earth, and they became slippery, because the Lord had cursed the land, that they could not hold them, nor retain them again. And it came to pass that there were sorceries, and witchcrafts, and magics, and the power of the evil one was wrought upon all the face of the land, even unto the fulfilling of all the words of Abinadi, and also Samuel the Lamanite. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency warned against intrigue with Satan's mysteries. It is not good practice to become intrigued by Satan and his mysteries. No good can come from getting close to evil. Like playing with fire, it is too easy to get burned. The only safe course is to keep well distance from him and any of his wicked activities or nefarious practices. The mischief of devil worship, sorcery, casting spells, Witchcraft, voodooism, black magic, and all other forms of demonism should be avoided like the plague. Today is day two for the Come Follow Me study for this week, October 28th through November 3rd. I would that I could persuade all to repent. Mormon 1 through 6. Tuesday, October 29th, 2024. Mormon 2, 1 through 17. Chapter 2. Mormon leads the Nephite armies. Blood and carnage sweep the land. 
The Nephites lament and mourn with the sorrowing of the damned. Their day of grace is past. Mormon obtains the plates of Nephi. War continues. About 327 to 350 AD. Mormon leads the Nephite armies. Mormon 2, 1 through 2. And it came to pass, in that same year, there began to be a war again between the Nephites and the Lamanites. And notwithstanding I being young, was large in stature. Therefore the people of Nephi appointed me that I should be their leader, or the leader of their armies. Therefore it came to pass that in my sixteenth year I did go forth at the head of an army of the Nephites against the Lamanites. Therefore three hundred and twenty and six years had passed away. Mormon does not provide us with much information concerning his boyhood, but the scanty details he does provide indicate, one, he was born probably in 310 or 311 A.D. He was about 10 years of age in 321 A.D. Two, he was a descendant of Nephi. Three, his father's name was Mormon, and he was named after the land of Mormon. Four, he was evidently born in the land northward. Five, at the age of 15, he was visited of the Lord. Six, despite his testimony of the divinity of Christ, he was forbidden to preach repentance unto the wicked people. Seven, in his sixteenth year, he was appointed leader of the Nephite armies, and he and his armies defended the Nephites from the Lamanites. Mormon 2, 3 through 7, and it came to pass that in the three hundred and twenty and seventh year, the Lamanites did come upon us with exceedingly great power, insomuch that they did frighten my armies. Therefore they would not fight, and they began to retreat towards the north countries. And it came to pass that we did come to the city of Angola, and we did take possession of the city, and take preparations to defend ourselves against the Lamanites. And it came to pass that we did fortify the city with our might, but notwithstanding all our fortifications, the Lamanites did come upon us and did drive us out of the city. And they did also drive us forth out of the land of David, and we marched forth and came to the land of Joshua which was in the borders west by the seashore. And it came to pass that we did gather in our people as fast as it were possible, that we might get them together in one body. Perhaps you could make a chart like the one below to help your children understand the difference between godly and worldly sorrow as they read Mormon 2, 8 and 10 through 15. Then they could also search Mormon 2, 12 to find reasons why repentance should make our hearts rejoice. Mormon 2, 8, but behold, the land was filled with robbers and with Lamanites, and notwithstanding the great destruction which hung over my people, they did not repent of their evil doings. Therefore, there was blood and carnage spread throughout all the face of the land, both on the part of the Nephites and also on the part of the Lamanites, and it was one complete revolution throughout all the face of the land. As wickedness increased among the Nephites, the Spirit of the Lord departed from their midst, that which formerly had made it possible for the Nephites to stand against superior numbers of the Lamanites was withdrawn, and the Nephites began to fall before the Lamanites. Still the Nephites did not repent, and Mormon says it was one complete revolution throughout all the face of the land. Also note that when Mormon says the land was filled with robbers and with Lamanites, he had already defined what constitutes a Lamanite in his day. Mormon 2.9 and now the Lamanites had a king, and his name was Aaron. And he came against us with an army of forty and four thousand. And behold, I withstood him with forty and two thousand. And it came to pass that I beat him with my army, that he fled before me. And behold, all this was done, and three hundred and thirty years had passed away. The Nephites experience the sorrowing of the damned. Mormon 2, 10-12 and it came to pass that the Nephites began to repent of their iniquity, and began to cry even as had been prophesied by Samuel the prophet. For behold, no man could keep that which was his own, for the thieves and the robbers and the murderers and the magic art and the witchcraft which was in the land. Thus there began to be a mourning and a lamentation in all the land because of these things, and more especially among the people of Nephi. And it came to pass that when I, Mormon, saw their lamentation and their mourning and their sorrow before the Lord, my heart did begin to rejoice within me, knowing the mercies and the long suffering of the Lord, therefore supposing that he would be merciful unto them, that they would again become a righteous people. President Dallin H. Oaks said, Repentance, which is an assured passage to an eternal destination, is nevertheless not a free ride. Why is it necessary for us to suffer on the way to repentance for serious transgressions? We often think of the results of repentance as simply cleansing us from sin. 
But that is an incomplete view of the matter. A person who sins is like a tree who bends easily in the wind. On a windy and rainy day, the tree bent so deeply against the ground that the leaves become soiled with mud like sin. If we only focus on cleansing the leaves, the weakness of the tree that allowed it to bend and soil its leaves may remain. Merely cleansing the leaves does not strengthen the tree in the next high wind. The susceptibility to repetition continues until the tree has been strengthened. President Ezra Taft Benson said, repentance means more than simply a reformation of behavior. Many men and women in the world demonstrate great willpower and self-discipline in overcoming bad habits and the weaknesses of the flesh. Yet, at the same time, they give no thought to the master, sometimes even openly rejecting him. Such changes of behavior, even if in a positive direction, do not constitute true repentance. It is not uncommon to find men and women in the world who feel remorse for the things they do wrong. Sometimes this is because their actions cause them or loved ones great sorrow and misery. Sometimes their sorrow is caused because they are caught and punished for their actions. Such worldly feelings do not constitute godly sorrow. President Spencer W. Kimball said, Often people indicate that they have repented when all they have done is to express regret for a wrong act. But true repentance is marked by that godly sorrow that changes, transforms, and saves. To be sorry is not enough. Perhaps the felon in the penitentiary, coming to realize the high price he must pay for his folly, may wish he had not committed the crime. That is not repentance. The truly penitent man is sorry before he is apprehended. He is sorry even if his secret is never known. He desires to make voluntary amends. Repentance of the godly type means that one comes to recognize the sin and voluntarily and without pressure from outside sources begins his transformation. Mormon 2.13 But behold, this my joy was vain, for their sorrowing was not unto repentance because of the goodness of God, but it was rather the sorrowing of the damned because the Lord would not always suffer them to take happiness in sin. When the Nephites discovered that they could no longer prevail against their enemies, there began to be a mourning and a lamentation in all the land. Mormon, thinking his people were about to repent, took heart only to discover that their sorrowing was not unto repentance, but rather the sorrowing of the damned. It was not godly sorrow, but worldly sorrow. To understand the difference, consider recording what you learn from Mormon 2, 10 through 15 in a chart like this one. Godly sorrow means coming to Jesus. Worldly sorrow curses God. How do you know if your sorrow is godly or worldly? True repentance involves a proper sorrow for sins. A person can be sorry for the wrong reason. He can be sorry that he was caught and punished. He can regret his actions because they caused a loss of reputation. Or like the Nephites, he can be sorry because his actions brought misery upon himself. However, such sorrow does not constitute true repentance. When the Apostle Paul heard of some grievous sins being tolerated in the church in Corinth, he wrote a sharp letter of reproof. Later word came back that the saints had taken Paul's letter in the proper spirit, and they had repented. Pleased, Paul wrote, Now I rejoice, not that ye are made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Godly sorrow is the recognition that in sinning we have offended God, and put our souls in jeopardy of spiritual death. Any other kind of sorrow is of the world, and will not lead us to repentance. The sacrifice required of all saints is that of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Such a state of heart and mind is arrived at only through godly sorrow. Elder Neal A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles noted the contrast between godly sorrow and the sorrowing of the damned. After recognition, real remorse floods the soul. This is a godly sorrow, not merely the sorrow of the world, nor the sorrowing of the damned, when we can no longer take happiness in sin. False remorse instead is like fondling our failings. In ritual regret, we mourn our mistakes, but without mending them. 
In contrast to the sorrowing of the damned, President Ezra Taft Benson explained the nature of godly sorrow so that we might understand the sorrow that leads to cleansing repentance. Godly sorrow is a gift of the Spirit. It is a deep realization that our actions have offended our Father and our God. It is the sharp and keen awareness that our behavior caused the Savior, He who knew no sin, even the greatest of all, to endure agony and suffering. Our sins caused Him to bleed at every pore. This very real mental and spiritual anguish is what the scriptures refer to as having a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Such a spirit is the absolute prerequisite of true repentance. Elder Orson Pratt eloquently differentiated between the sorrowing of the damned and the godly sorrow which worketh repentance. There are different kinds of sorrow. Thieves, robbers, murderers, adulterers, etc. are frequently sorrowful because they have been detected of the crimes they have committed. They are not sorrowful because they have sinned against God or because they have injured others, but they are sorry because their crimes have been exposed or that they have been prevented from a realization of the happiness which they anticipated. This is the sorrow of the world, and it is of the same nature as the sorrowing of the evil spirits in hell. They are sorry when they fail to accomplish their malicious designs against God and his people. This kind of sorrow worketh death. Others have a species of sorrow arising through fear. They are convinced that they have, in numerous instances, violated the law of God, and they greatly fear the consequences in the great judgment day, but yet they feel no disposition to reform. But the sorrow that is acceptable in the sight of God is that which leads to true repentance or reformation of conduct. It is that sorrow which arises not only through fear of punishment, but through a proper sense of the evil consequences of sin. It is that sorrow which arises from a knowledge of our own unworthiness and from a contrast of our own degraded and fallen condition with the mercy, goodness, and holiness of God. We are sorry that we should ever have condescended to do evil. We are sorry that we should ever have rendered ourselves so unworthy before God. We are sorry at the weakness of our own fallen nature. This kind of sorrow will lead us to obey every commandment of God. It will make us humble and childlike in our dispositions. It will impart unto us meekness and lowliness of mind. It will cause our hearts to be broken and our spirits to be contrite. It will cause us to watch with great carefulness every word, thought, and deed. It will call up our past dealings with mankind, and we will feel most anxious to make restitution to all whom we may have in any way injured. These and many other good things are the results of godly sorrow for sin. This is repentance not in word, but in deed. This is the sorrow with which the heavens are pleased. If you are experiencing worldly sorrow, how can you change it into godly sorrow? How can we make sure that the sorrow we feel for our sins leads us to seek God's help to change? Mormon 2, 14-15 and they did not come unto Jesus with broken hearts and contrite spirits, but they did curse God and wish to die. Nevertheless, they would struggle with the sword for their lives. And it came to pass that my sorrow did return unto me again, and I saw that the day of grace was past with them, both temporally and spiritually. For I saw thousands of them hewn down in open rebellion against their God, and heaped up as dung upon the face of the land. And thus three hundred and forty and four years had passed away. The people were beyond the state where they could repent. As Samuel said to the Nephites of an earlier day, your days of probation are past. Ye have procrastinated the day of your salvation until it is everlastingly too late, and your destruction is made sure. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland noted the chilling line in Mormon's account that time had run out for saving his people. It is at this point in Nephite history, just under 950 years since it had begun, and just over 300 years since they had been visited by the Son of God himself, that Mormon realized the story was finished. In perhaps the most chilling line he ever wrote, Mormon asserted simply, I saw that the day of grace was passed with them, both temporally and spiritually. His people had learned that most fateful of all lessons, that the Spirit of God will not always strive with man, that it is possible, collectively as well as individually, to have time run out, 
the day of repentance can pass, and it had passed for the Nephites. Their numbers were being hewn down in open rebellion against their God. And in a metaphor almost too vivid in its moral commentary, they were being heaped up as dung upon the face of the land. President Spencer W. Kimball described how we today might also remove ourselves from the cleansing grace of repentance. It is true that the great principle of repentance is always available, but for the wicked and rebellious, there are serious reservations to this statement. For instance, sin is intensely habit-forming and sometimes moves men to the tragic point of no return. As the transgressor moves deeper and deeper into his sin, the error is entrenched more deeply, and the will to change is weakened. It becomes increasingly near hopeless, and he skids down and down until either he does not want to climb back or he has lost the power to do so. Elder James E. Talmadge said, as the time of repentance is procrastinated, the ability to repent grows weaker. Neglect of opportunity in holy things develops inability. Elder Joseph Fielding Smith said the following, It is possible for people to get so far in the dark through rebellion and wickedness that the spirit of repentance leaves them. It is a gift of God, and they get behind the power of repentance. How well Mormon speaks of that in reference to the people who turned away with their eyes open, who turned against the truth some 200 years following the coming of Christ. The people rebelled. Mormon speaks about them and their condition beyond the power of redemption because of their wickedness and the hardness of their hearts, which the Spirit of the Lord could not penetrate. They sinned willfully, and therefore salvation cannot come to them. It was offered to them, and they would not have it. They rejected it. They fought it and preferred to take the course of rebellion. And the Lord on one occasion said to Mormon, You shall not preach to this people. They have turned against me, and you shall not preach to them. He had a right to say that. Now, why did he say that? Because they had every opportunity and would not receive the truth. They mocked at it. And so the Lord said, You don't have to talk to them. There is no need to cry repentance to them any longer. And after a while, Mormon still pleaded with the Lord to let him try again. It was useless. Mormon 2, 16-17 And it came to pass that in the 345th year, the Nephites did begin to flee before the Lamanites, and they were pursued until they came even to the land of Jashon, before it was possible to stop them in their retreat. And now the city of Jashon was near the land where Amaron had deposited the records unto the Lord, that they might not be destroyed. Notwithstanding I being young, I was large in stature. Therefore the people appointed me that I should be the leader of their armies. And I did go forth at the head of the army against the Lamanites. And great destruction hung over my people, for they did not repent of their evil doings. Thus there began to be a mourning and a lamentation in all the land. But their sorrowing was not unto repentance, because of the goodness of God, but it was rather the sorrowing of the damned, because the Lord would not always suffer them to take happiness in sin. And they did not come unto Jesus with broken hearts and contrite spirits, but they did curse God and wish to die. And now the city of Jashon was near the land where Amaron had deposited the records unto the Lord, that they might not be destroyed. 
Mormon 2.17 continued, And behold, I had gone according to the word of Amaron, and taken the plates of Nephi, and did make a record according to the words of Amaron. In God. Believe that He is and that He created all things both in heaven and in earth. Our title of liberty. In memory of our God, our religion and freedom, and our peace, our wives and our children. He is the light and the life of the world, yea, a light that is endless, that can never be darkened, and also a life which is endless, but there can be no more death. Here are the waters of Mormon, and now, as ye are desirous to come into the fold of God, and to be called his people, and are willing to bear one another's burdens that they may be light. Oh, blessed Jesus, who has saved me from an awful hell. Oh, blessed God, have mercy on this people. Now, as I said concerning faith, faith is not to have a perfect knowledge of things. Therefore, if ye have faith, ye hope for things which are not seen, which are true. 400 years pass not away, save the sword of justice falleth upon this people. Nothing can save this people, save it be repentance and faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Behold, I am Jesus Christ, whom the prophets testified shall come into the world. And behold, I am the light and the life of the world. taken the plates of Nephi, and did make a record according to Amaron's words. Elder Anthony W. Ivan said, It will be observed that at this time only the plates of Nephi were removed from the hill Shim by Mormon. Today is day three for the Come Follow Me study for this week, October 28th through November 3rd. I would that I could persuade all to repent. Mormon 1 through 6.
Wednesday, October 30th, 2024, Mormon 2, 18 through 29. Mormon's anguish over the wickedness of his people. Mormon 2, 18. And upon the plates of Nephi, I did make a full account of all the wickedness and abominations. But upon these plates, I did forbear to make a full account of their wickedness and abominations. For behold, a continual scene of wickedness and abominations has been before mine eyes ever since I have been sufficient to behold the ways of man. When Amaron turned the responsibility of the records over to Mormon, he indicated that Mormon should engrave on the plates of Nephi all the things that he had observed concerning his people. Thus, Mormon's major record of the events of his day were written on the large plates of Nephi. However, later in his life, he was commanded by the Lord to make a separate set of plates, the plates of Mormon. He then abridged onto his own plates all of the writings from the large plates of Nephi, including his own writings. Concerning his writings on these two sets of plates, Mormon said, And upon the plates of Nephi I did make a full account of all the wickedness and abominations. But upon these plates, the plates of Mormon, I did forbear to make a full account of the wickedness and abominations. Earlier in his writings, Mormon indicated he did not write on the plates of Mormon even one hundredth part of the things that were written on the large plates of Nephi. Mormon 2.19, And woe is me because of their wickedness, for my heart has been filled with sorrow because of their wickedness all my days. For behold, a continual scene of wickedness and abominations has been before mine eyes, ever since I have been sufficient to behold the ways of man. And woe is me because of their wickedness. For my heart has been filled with sorrow because of their wickedness all my days. Mormon 2.19 continued. Nevertheless, I know that I shall be lifted up at the last day. What words did Mormon use to describe the world he lived in? How did he maintain hope despite his surroundings? What do we learn from this verse that gave hope to Mormon amidst his sorrow for the wickedness of his people? Key. C-E-M-S means calling an election made sure, gaining the promise of eternal life. Pink are the prerequisites of calling an election made sure. Yellow, becoming perfected or receiving calling an election made sure. Orange, more sure word of prophecy or knowing you have your calling an election made sure. Teal, rending or parting the veil. Green, more light and knowledge, a prerequisite and blessing or privilege of having the calling an election made sure. Purple, presence of divinity, a blessing or privilege of having calling an election made sure. Blue, his kingdom, or the holy city of Zion. We should strive to make our calling an election sure, that is, to so live that we receive assurance from the Lord that when this life is over, we shall be exalted and dwell with him. Mormon receives this blessing, as did other Nephite prophets. Regarding his calling an election, Mormon said, I know that I shall be lifted up at the last day. Doctrine and Covenants 131, the more sure word of prophecy means a man's knowing that he is sealed up unto eternal life by revelation and by the spirit of prophecy through the power of the holy priesthood. During his sermon at Yalrom, the prophet Joseph Smith also spoke about the more sure word of prophecy mentioned in 2 Peter 119. He taught the saints in that settlement that a more sure word of prophecy is a confirmation from the spirit that allows a person to know that his or her calling an election has been made sure. It is reassurance given to faithful followers of Jesus Christ that they are sealed in the heavens and have the promise of eternal life in the kingdom of God. He explained that this knowledge would be as an anchor to the soul, sure and steadfast, though the thunders may roll and lightnings flash and earthquakes bellow and war gather thick around, yet this hope and knowledge would support the soul in every hour of trial, trouble, and tribulation. Elder Bruce McConkie said, Those members of the church who devote themselves wholly to righteousness, living by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of God, make their calling and election sure. 
That is, they receive the more sure word of prophecy, which means that the Lord seals their exaltation upon them while they are yet in this life. Peter summarized the course of righteousness, which the saints must pursue to make their calling and election sure, and then referring to his experience on the Mount of Transfiguration with James and John, said that those three had received this more sure word of prophecy. Those so favorable to the Lord are sealed up against all manner of sin and blasphemy, except the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost and the shedding of innocent blood. That is, their exaltation is assured. Their calling and election is made sure because they have obeyed the fullness of God's laws and have overcome the world. President Russell M. Nelson said, what does it mean to overcome the world? It means overcoming the temptation to care more about the things of this world than the things of God. It means trusting the doctrine of Christ more than the philosophies of men. It means delighting in truth, denouncing deception, and becoming humble followers of Christ. It means choosing to refrain from anything that drives the spirit away. It means being willing to give away even our favorite sins. President Spencer W. Kimball said, I have learned that where there is a prayerful heart, a hungering after righteousness, a forsaking of sins, and obedience to the commandments of God, the Lord pours out more and more light until there is finally power to pierce the heavenly veil. A person of such righteousness has the priceless promise that one day he shall see the Lord's face and know that he is. President Russell M. Nelson said, The house of the Lord is a house of learning. There the Lord teaches in his own way. There each ordinance teaches about the Savior. There we learn how to part the veil and communicate more clearly with heaven. And to each of you who has made temple covenants, I plead with you to seek prayerfully and consistently to understand temple covenants and ordinances. Spiritual doors will open. You will learn how to part the veil between heaven and earth, how to ask for God's angels to attend you, and how better to receive direction from heaven. Doctrine and Covenant 67. And again, verily, I say unto you that it is your privilege and promise I give unto you that have been ordained unto this ministry, that inasmuch as you strip yourselves from jealousies and fears, and humble yourselves before me, for ye are not sufficiently humble. The veil shall be rent, and you shall see me, and know that I am, not with the carnal, neither the natural mind, but with the spiritual. The Holy of Holies was the most sacred room in the ancient temple. It symbolized the presence of God. Once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest passed through the veil of the temple and entered into the Holy of Holies, where he sprinkled the blood of a sin offering to atone for the sins of all the congregation of Israel. When the veil of the temple was rent in twain, or torn in two, at the death of Jesus Christ, it was a dramatic symbol that the Savior, the great high priest, had passed through the veil of death and would shortly enter into the presence of God. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote that in addition to the Savior entering the presence of the Father, the Holy of Holies is now open to all, and all through the atoning blood of the Lamb can now enter into the highest and holiest of all places, that kingdom where eternal life is found. Paul, in expressive language, shows how the ordinances performed through the veil of the ancient temple were in similitude of what Christ was to do, which he now having done, the Apostle Paul taught that just as the torn veil of the temple allowed symbolic entrance into the Holy of Holies, it is the torn flesh of Jesus Christ that opens the way for us into the presence of the Father. Hebrews 10, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, my flesh. Having established the image of Jesus Christ as high priest entering into the Holy of Holies or the presence of God to intercede for us through his blood, Paul then exhorted his readers to follow Christ into God's presence by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Just as the veil of the ancient tabernacle or temple provided access to the Holy of Holies in Paul's metaphor, the flesh of Jesus Christ offered as a sacrifice for sin and raised to resurrected glory enables us to enter into God's presence. In each case, this was the only means provided to enter. In both the ancient and modern times, the veil of the temple has symbolized separation from the presence of the Lord. The Lord promised the elders who were in attendance at the conference that if they stripped themselves of jealousies and fears and humbled themselves, the veil between him and them would be rent and they would see and know him. The Lord explained that no one 
had seen him except those who had been quickened or spiritually enlivened by the Spirit of God because the natural or mortal man cannot abide his presence. Although the Lord declared that the elders were not sufficiently ready to receive such a glorious blessing at that time, he encouraged them to continue in patience until they were perfected. President Dieter F. Uchtdorf for the First Presidency explained the role of patience in becoming perfected. Without patience, we cannot please God. We cannot become perfect. Indeed, patience is a purifying process that refines understanding, deepens happiness, focuses action, and offers hope for peace. Patience means active, waiting, and enduring. It means staying with something and doing all that we can, working, hoping, and exercising faith, bearing hardship with fortitude, even when the desires of our hearts are delayed. Patience is not simply enduring, it is enduring well. Patience is a godly attribute that can heal souls, unlock treasures of knowledge and understanding, and transform ordinary men and women into saints and angels. Patience is a process of perfection. The Savior himself said that in your patience, you possess your souls. Or to use another translation of the Greek text, in your patience, you win mastery of your souls. Patience means to abide in faith knowing that sometimes it is in the waiting rather than the receiving that we grow the most. Revelations 22, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. 3 Nephi 15, Behold, I am the law and the light. Look unto me and endure to the end. And ye shall live, for unto him that endureth to the end will I give eternal life. Eternal life, or exaltation, is to live in God's presence. One remarkable truth of the restored gospel is that the heavens are not sealed, that God still speaks to his children and reveals his will to them. And one amazing aspect of that knowledge is that God will reveal himself to individuals who meet certain prerequisites. The scriptures record that many ancient prophets saw God and the present dispensation was opened by a vision in which God and Christ appeared to Joseph Smith in the sacred grove. But several places in the Doctrine and Covenants, including section 67, teach that this privilege is not reserved for prophets alone, but for anyone willing to pay the price required in personal righteousness. The prophet Joseph Smith taught that after a person has faith in Christ, repents of his sins, and is baptized for the remission of his sins, and receives the Holy Ghost, which is the first comforter, then let him continue to humble himself before God, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, and living by every word of God. And the Lord will soon say unto him, Son, thou shalt be exalted. When the Lord has thoroughly proved him, and finds that the man is determined to serve him at all hazards, then the man will find his calling and election made sure. Then it will be his privilege to receive the other comforter, which the Lord hath promised the saints. Now what is this other comforter? It is no more nor less than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And this is the sum and substance of the whole matter, that when any man obtains this last comforter, he will have the personage of Jesus Christ to attend him, or peer unto him from time to time, and even he will manifest the Father unto him, and they will take up their abode with him. And the visions of the heavens will be opened unto him, and the Lord will teach him face to face, and he may have a perfect knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Such a privilege does not come easily. A high level of righteousness and commitment must be demonstrated in the life of an individual before God will appear to him. And yet, step by step, a person can reach that degree. The prophet Joseph Smith taught how this growth can occur. We consider that God has created man with a mind capable of instruction and a faculty which may be enlarged in proportion to the heed and diligence given to the light communicated from heaven to the intellect, and that the nearer man approaches perfection, the clearer are his views and the greater his enjoyments, till he has overcome the evils of his life and lost every desire for sin. And like the ancients, arrives at that point of faith where he is wrapped in the power and glory of his maker and is caught up to dwell with him. 
But we consider that this is a station to which no man ever arrived in a moment, who must have been instructed in the government and laws of that kingdom by proper degrees, until his mind is capable in some measure of comprehending the propriety, justice, equality, and consistency of the same. The prophet Joseph Smith said, make your calling and election sure. What is the secret, the starting point? According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. How did he obtain all things? Through the knowledge of him who hath called him. There could not anything be given pertaining to life and godliness without knowledge. Woe, woe, woe to Christendom, especially divines and priests, if this be true. Salvation is for a man to be saved from all his enemies. For until a man can triumph over death, he is not saved. A knowledge of the priesthood alone will do this. 1 Corinthians 13. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Doctrine and Covenants 110. The veil was taken off our minds, and the eyes of our understanding were opened. Elder Bruce McConkie said these statements about the two comforters climax and crown the teachings of the Son of God. We have no record of anything he ever said which can so completely withdraw the curtain of eternity and open to the faithful the vision of the glories of God. Based on love born of obedience, Jesus promises the saints that they can have here and now in this life the following. One, the gift and constant companionship of the Holy Ghost. The comfort and peace which is the function of that Holy Spirit to bestow. The revelation and the sanctifying power which alone can prepare men for the companionship of gods and angels hereafter. Two, personal visitations from the second comforter, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The resurrected and perfected being who dwells with his Father in the mansions on high. And three, God the Father, Mark it well, Philip, shall visit man in person, take up his abode with him, as it were, and reveal to him all the hidden mysteries of his kingdom. President Joseph Fielding Smith said, Those who press forward in righteousness, living by every word of revealed truth, have power to make their calling and election sure. They receive the more sure word of prophecy and know by revelation and the authority of the priesthood that they are sealed up unto eternal life. President Joseph Fielding Smith also said, If a man gets knowledge enough to have the companionship of the Son of God, the chances are his call and election would be sure. Joseph Smith Jr. said, First key, knowledge is the power of salvation. Second key, make your calling and election sure. Third key, it is one thing to be on the mount and hear the excellent voice, etc., and another to hear the voice declare to you, you have a part and lot in that kingdom. What is the kingdom Jesus is speaking about? Elder D. Todd Christopherson taught, when Daniel interpreted the dream of Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, making known to the king what shall be in the latter days, he declared that the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all other kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. The churches that prophesied letter day kingdom, not created by man, but set up by the God of heaven and rolling forth as a stone, cut out of the mountain without hands, to fill the earth. Its destiny is to establish Zion in preparation for the return and millennial rule of Jesus Christ. Before that day, it will not be a kingdom in any political sense, as the Savior said. My kingdom is not of this world. Rather, it is the repository of his authority in the earth the administrator of his holy covenants, the custodian of his temples, the protector and proclaimer of his truth, the gathering place for scattered Israel, and a defense and a refuge from the storm and from wrath, when it shall be poured out without mixture upon the whole earth. Joseph Smith also said, Oh, I beseech you to go forward, go forward and make your calling an election sure. President Ezra Taft Benson said, Now there is a lifetime goal to walk in his steps, to perfect ourselves in every virtue as he has done, to seek his face, and to work to make our calling and election sure. Joseph Anderson, the assistant to the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, said, And what is that life-giving purpose, that goal toward which we should all be striving? 
It is the gospel of Jesus Christ as restored to man in this great dispensation. It is, of course, necessary that we have the physical necessities of life. It is natural that we should want the things that make life, physical life, desirable and pleasurable. But if in obtaining such things, we neglect those things that are of eternal worth, the spiritual part of life, when we have mistaken the shaft for the wheat of life, we have failed to recognize the eternal purpose of our existence. We have neglected the cement, which is necessary if we are to build a life that will make our calling and election sure. Yes, eternal life in the presence of our Heavenly Father. Joseph Smith also counseled the saints to seek for this gift. I would exhort you to go on and continue to call upon God until you make your calling and election sure for yourselves by obtaining this more sure word of prophecy and wait patiently for the promise until you obtain it. Mormon 2, 20 through 24. And it came to pass that in this year, the people of Nephi again were hunted and driven. And it came to pass that we were driven forth until we had come northward to the land, which was called Shem. And it came to pass that we did fortify the city of Shem. And we did gather in our people as much as it were possible that perhaps we might save them from destruction. And it came to pass in the 340 and six year, they began to come upon us again. And it came to pass that I did speak unto my people and did urge them with great energy that they should stand boldly before the Lamanites and fight for their wives and their children and their houses and their homes. And my words did arouse them somewhat to vigor insomuch that they did not flee from before the Lamanites, but did stand with boldness against them. How did Mormon arouse the Nephites somewhat to vigor so they could withstand the Lamanites? How did Mormon follow Jesus Christ? How did Mormon's faith in Jesus Christ help or bless others? How can our faith help people we know? Mormon 2, 25 through 26. And it came to pass that we did contend with an army of 30,000 against an army of 50,000. And it came to pass that we did stand before them with such firmness that they did flee from before us. And it came to pass that when they had fled, we did pursue them with our armies and did meet them again and did beat them. Nevertheless, the strength of the Lord was not with us. Yea, we were left to ourselves, that the spirit of the Lord did not abide in us. Therefore, we had become weak, like unto our brethren. What sad comment did Mormon make regarding his people's strength? We may not recognize and appreciate how much Heavenly Father helps us in our daily lives as we strive to live faithfully. Mormon wrote that when his people became wicked, they lost the strength of the Lord that had previously protected them. While serving as a member of the 70, Elder Ray H. Wood explained, When a person violates any of God's commandments, if there is no repentance, the Lord withdraws his protective and sustaining influence. When we lose power with God, we know of a certainty that the problem lies within us and not within God. I, the Lord, am bound when you do what I say, but when you do not what I say, ye have no promise. Our misdeeds bring despair. They sadden and extinguish the perfect brightness of hope offered by Christ. Without God's help, we are left to ourselves. Doctrine and Covenants 3. For although a man may have many revelations and have power to do many mighty works, yet if he boasts in his own strength and sets at naught the counsels of God and follows after the dictates of his own will and carnal desires, he must fall and incur the vengeance of a just God upon him. Except thou do this, thou shalt be delivered up and become as other men. Mormon 2, 27-29 And my heart did sorrow because of this, the great calamity of my people, because of their wickedness and their abominations. But behold, we did go forth against the Lamanites and the robbers of Gadianton, until we had taken again possession of the lands of our inheritance. And the three hundred and forty and ninth year had passed away, and then the three hundred and fiftieth year we made a treaty with the Lamanites and the robbers of Gadianton, in which we could get the lands of our inheritance divided. And the Lamanites did give unto us the land northward, yea, even to the narrow passage, which led into the land southward. And we did give unto the Lamanites all the land southward. T. 
Today is day four for the Come Follow Me study for this week, October 28th through November 3rd. I would that I could persuade all to repent. Mormon 1 through 6. Thursday, October 31st, 2024, Mormon 3. Mormon cries repentance unto the Nephites. They gain a great victory and glory in their own strength. Mormon refuses to lead them, and his prayers for them are without faith. The Book of Mormon invites the twelve tribes of Israel to believe the gospel. About 360 to 362 A.D. Mormon cries repentance, but to no avail. Mormon 3, 1 through 2. And it came to pass that the Lamanites did not come to battle again until ten years more had passed away. And behold, I had employed my people the Nephites in preparing their lands and their arms against the time of battle. And it came to pass that the Lord did say unto me, Cry unto this people, Repent ye, and come unto me, and be baptized, and build up again my church, and ye shall be spared. Mormon observed that the Nephites did not acknowledge the ways that the Lord had blessed them. As you read Mormon 3, 3 and 9, you might ponder how you are acknowledging God's influence in your life. Inviting your children to list or draw pictures of some things they are grateful for might be a good way to help them feel gratitude for God. After they have made a list, you could read Mormon 3, 3 and 9. Mormon 3, 3. And I did cry unto this people. Elder Marion G. Romney said, We who today bear the priesthood of God are the legal heirs to this great commission. Ours is the responsibility of officially declaring repentance unto all the inhabitants of the earth. None are exempt. We must discharge this responsibility regardless of the manner in which our message is received. President Joseph Fielding Smith said, that is our duty. When we see evil lurking, when we see dangers confronting the people, and especially the Latter-day Saints, it is our duty to raise the warning voice, and not only in behalf of the Latter-day Saints, but to warn all people, for our mission is one that is worldwide, and we should warn all men and give them the opportunity of repentance of serving the Lord and keeping his commandments if they will. If they will not, then we have saved our souls. We are clear from the blood of this generation. That is our duty. Mormon 3.3 3 continued, But it was in vain, and they did not realize that it was the Lord that had spared them and granted unto them a chance for repentance. And behold, they did harden their hearts against the Lord their God. How can you recognize the Lord's influence in your life? Mormon 3, 4 through 9. And it came to pass that after this tenth year had passed away, making in the whole 360 years from the coming of Christ, the king of the Lamanites sent an epistle unto me, which gave unto me to know that they were preparing to come again to battle against us. And it came to pass that I did cause my people that they should gather themselves together at the land desolation, to a city which was in the borders by the narrow pass which led to the land southward. And there we did place our armies that we might stop the armies of the Lamanites, that they might not get possession of any of our lands. Therefore we did fortify against them with all our force. And it came to pass that in the three hundred and sixty and first year, the Lamanites did come down to the land of desolation to battle against us. And it came to pass that in that year, we did beat them, insomuch that they did return to their own lands again. And in the three hundred and sixty and second year, they did come down again to battle. And we did beat them again, and did slay a great number of them, and their dead were cast into the sea. And now because of this great thing which my people, the Nephites, had done, they began to boast in their own strength, and began to swear before the heavens that they would avenge themselves of the blood of their brethren who had been slain by their enemies. Heavenly Father had blessed the Nephites too, but they had not recognized it. What can we do to show we are thankful to Heavenly Father for our blessings. Elder Neil A. Maxwell cautioned us to recognize Heavenly Father's power instead of our own. Before enjoying the harvest of righteous efforts, let us therefore first acknowledge God's hand. Before enjoying the harvest of righteous efforts, let us therefore first acknowledge God's hand. Otherwise, the rationalizations appear and they include my power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. Or we vaunt ourselves, as ancient Israel would have done, except for Gideon's deliberately small army, by boasting that mine own hand has saved me. Touting our own hand 
makes it doubly hard to confess God's hand in all things. What blessings come when you acknowledge His influence? What are the consequences of not acknowledging Him? Mormon 3, 10 through 11. And they did swear by the heavens and also by the throne of God that they would go up to battle against their enemies and would cut them off from the face of the earth. And it came to pass that I, Mormon, did utterly refuse from this time forth to be a commander and a leader of this people because of their wickedness and abominations. In spite of Mormon leading his people for approximately 35 years, at this point he refused to lead them. Mormon must have been influenced by the abridgment he was making of the Book of Mormon. He saw Captain Moroni's and Helaman's justifiable reasons to go to war, defending their lands, houses, wives, children, rights, privileges, liberty, and ability to worship. He taught the people these purposes of war. After seeing the motivation the Nephites in his day had for fighting the Lamanites to avenge themselves, and that they began to boast in their own strength, and that they were guilty of great wickedness and abominations, he temporarily refused to lead their armies. Mormon 3.12 Behold, I had led them. Notwithstanding their wickedness, I had led them many times to battle, and had loved them according to the love of God which was in me. With all my heart and my soul had been poured out in prayer unto my God all the day long for them. Nevertheless, it was without faith, because of the hardness of their hearts. How did Mormon feel about the people around him? What can you do to develop the kind of love he had? When he was in the presiding bishopric, Bishop Glenn L. Pace admonished us to strive to emulate the love Mormon exhibited. This prophet had Christ-like love for a fallen people. Can we be content with loving less? We must press forward with the pure love of Christ to spread the good news of the gospel. As we do so, and fight the war of good against evil, light against darkness, and truth against falsehood, we must not neglect our responsibility of dressing the wounds of those who have fallen in battle. There is no room in the kingdom for fatalism. Mormon 3, 13-16 And thrice have I delivered them out of the hands of their enemies, and they have repented not of their sins. And when they had sworn by all that had been forbidden them by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that they would go up unto their enemies to battle and avenge themselves of the blood of their brethren, behold, the voice of the Lord came unto me, saying, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay. And because this people repented not after I had delivered them, behold, they shall be cut off from the face of the earth. And it came to pass that I utterly refused to go up against mine enemies, and I did, even as the Lord had commanded me, and I did stand as an idle witness to manifest unto the world the things which I saw and heard, according to the manifestations of the Spirit, which had testified of things to come. Stop! I did cry unto this people. But it was in vain, and they did not realize that it was the Lord that had spared them, and granted unto them a chance for repentance. And it came to pass that the king of the Lamanites sent an epistle unto me, that they were preparing to come again to battle against us. Word. And we did beat them. And now, because of this great thing which my people had done, they began to boast in their own strength. I did utterly refuse from this time forth to be a commander and a leader of this people because of their wickedness and abomination. I swear by the throne of God, 
but we will cut our enemies from off the face of this land! I had led them and had loved them according to the love of God which was in me with all my heart. And my soul had been poured out in prayer unto my God all the day long for them. Nevertheless, it was without faith because of the hardness of their hearts. And I did stand as an idle witness to manifest unto the world the things which I saw and heard. When the Nephites began to boast in their own strength and began to swear before the heavens that they would avenge themselves of the blood of their brethren, who had been slain by their enemies, Mormon refused to command them any more. Like ether of an earlier day, Mormon began to stand as an idle witness to manifest unto the world the things which he saw and heard. He had led the Nephites and had loved them and had prayed earnestly for them all the day long. But he refused to follow them into even greater wickedness. Self-defense and vengeance are not the same. The Lord sometimes justifies his people in fighting to defend their homes and families from attack, but he does not justify offensive war. The Lord said, vengeance is mine and I will repay. It is God who deals out retribution unto men. In taking the offensive, the Nephites went off to battle without the sanction of the Lord, which resulted in the eventual destruction of an entire nation. Though Mormon couldn't teach his people because of the hardness of their hearts, he tried to teach future readers to learn from history and avoid the terrible mistakes his people had made. Mormon's words to go forth to the Gentiles and the house of Israel. Mormon 3, 17 through 19. Therefore I write unto you Gentiles, and also unto you house of Israel, when the work shall commence, that ye shall be about to prepare to return to the land of your inheritance. Yea, behold, I write unto all the ends of the earth, yea, unto you twelve tribes of Israel, who shall be judged according to your works by the twelve whom Jesus chose to be his disciples in the land of Jerusalem. And I write also unto the remnant of this people, who shall also be judged by the twelve whom Jesus chose in this land, and they shall be judged by the other twelve whom Jesus chose in the land of Jerusalem. Elder Spencer J. Condy said, questions are sometimes raised regarding the relationship between the twelve apostles in the land of Jerusalem and the twelve disciples whom Jesus chose from among the Nephites. Mormon makes it clear that the twelve tribes of Israel are to be judged by the twelve in Jerusalem. The remnant of Lehi will be judged by the twelve Nephite disciples, and they in turn shall be judged by the other twelve whom Jesus chose in the land of Jerusalem. Mormon 3.20 And these things doth the Spirit manifest unto me. Therefore I write unto you all. And for this cause I write unto you that ye may know that ye must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, yea, every soul who belongs to the whole human family of Adam. And ye must stand to be judged of your works, whether they be good or evil. President Dallin H. Oaks of the First Presidency explained, The final judgment is not just an evaluation of a sum total of good and evil acts, what we have done. It is an acknowledgement of the final effect of our acts and thoughts, what we have become. It is not enough for anyone just to go through the motions. The commandments, ordinances, and covenants of the gospel are not a list of deposits required to be made in some heavenly account. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a plan that shows us how to become what our Heavenly Father desires us to become. Elder Bruce McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that others would take part in our judgment. The reality is that there will be a whole hierarchy of judges who under Christ shall judge the righteous. He alone shall issue the decrees of damnation for the wicked. The scriptures teach that there will be at least five sources who will take part on judgment day. One, ourselves, two, our bishops, three, scriptures, four, apostles, five, Jesus Christ. President John Taylor further elaborated on the role of the apostles in our judgment. Christ is at our head. It would seem to be quite reasonable if the twelve apostles in Jerusalem are to be the judges of the twelve tribes, and the twelve disciples on this continent are to be the judges of the descendants of Nephi, that the brother of Jared and Jared should be the judges of the Jaredites, their descendants, and further, that the first presidency and twelve who have officiated in our age should operate in regard to mankind in this dispensation. President Heber C. Kimball said, 
Brother Joseph Smith many a time said to Brother Brigham and myself and to others that he was a representative of God to us, to teach and direct us and reprove the wrongdoers. He has passed behind the veil. But there never will be a person in this dispensation enter into the celestial glory without his approbation. Elder Bruce McConkie said, And thus, for this dispensation of grace, we come to Joseph Smith. He was called of God to reveal anew the doctrines of salvation. He was called of God to stand as the Lord's legal administrator, dispensing salvation to all men. Repeat, all men in the last days. Christ is the true vine. Joseph Smith is the chief branch for our day. And thus all men, every living soul who has lived or shall live on earth between the spring of 1820 and that glorious future day when the Son of God shall return to reign personally on earth, all men in the latter days must turn to Joseph Smith to gain salvation. Why? The answer is clear and plain. Let it speak with seven thunders. He alone can bring them the gospel. He alone can perform for them the ordinances of salvation and exaltation. He stands, as have all the prophets of all the ages in their times and seasons, in the place and stead of the Holy One in administering salvation to men on earth. President Brigham Young said, How are you going to get your resurrection? You will get it by the president of the resurrection pertaining to this generation, and that is Joseph Smith, Jr. Hear it all, ye ends of the earth. If you ever enter into the kingdom of God, it is because Joseph Smith let you go there. This will apply to Jews and Gentiles, to the bond and the free, to friends and foes. No man or woman in this generation will get a resurrection to be crowned without Joseph Smith saying so. The man who was martyred in Carthage Jail, state of Illinois, holds the keys of life and death to this generation. He is the president of the resurrection in this dispensation. Mormon 3, 21 through 22. And also that ye may believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, which ye shall have among you. And also that the Jews, the covenant people of the Lord, shall have other witness besides him whom they saw and heard, that Jesus whom they slew was the very Christ and the very God. And I would that I would persuade all ye ends of the earth to repent and prepare to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And it hath become expedient that I should make a small record of the time that Lehi left Jerusalem, even down into the present time. I do make my record from the accounts which have been given by those who were before me until the commencement of my day. I write unto you Gentiles, yea, I write unto all the ends of the earth, yea, unto you twelve tribes of Israel. And I write also unto the remnant of this people, I write unto you all, that ye may know that ye must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, yea, every soul must stand to be judged of your works, whether they be good or evil that ye may believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, which ye shall have among you. And I would that I could persuade all ye ends of the earth to repent and prepare to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. President Gordon B. Hinckley testified that the Book of Mormon is another witness of Christ. This scripture of the new world is before us as an added witness of the divinity and reality of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the encompassing beneficence of his atonement, and of his coming forth from the darkness of the grave. Within these covers is found much of the sure word of prophecy concerning him who should be born of a virgin, the son of the Almighty God. There is a foretelling of his work among men as a living mortal. There is a declaration of his death, of the Lamb without blemish, who was to be sacrificed for the sins of the world. And there is an account that is moving and inspiring and true of the visit of the resurrected Christ among living men and women in the Western continent. The testimony is here to handle. It is here to be read. It is here to be pondered. And it is here to be prayed for with a promise that he who prays shall know by the power of the Holy Ghost it is true and valid. How did Mormon follow Jesus Christ? How did Mormon's faith in Jesus Christ help or bless others? How can our faith help people we know? Write a verse-by-verse -verse analysis of Mormon 3, 17-22.
and explain to a friend or family member the important points contained in these verses. Today is day five for the Come Follow Me study for this week, October 28th through November 3rd. I would that I could persuade all to repent. Mormon 1 through 6. Friday, November 1st, 2024, Mormon 4 and 5. Greater wickedness than ever before prevails among Nephites. Chapter 4. War and carnage continue. The wicked punish the wicked. Greater wickedness prevails than ever before in all Israel. Women and children are sacrificed to idols. The Lamanites begin to sweep the Nephites before them. About 363 to 375 A.D. Mormon 4, 1-5 And now it came to pass that in the 360 and third year, the Nephites did go up with their armies to battle against the Lamanites out of the land desolation. And it came to pass that the armies of the Nephites were driven back again to the land of desolation. And while they were yet weary, a fresh army of the Lamanites did come upon them. And they had a sore battle, insomuch that the Lamanites did take possession of the city desolation, and did slay many of the Nephites, and did take many prisoners. And the remainder did flee, and join the inhabitants of the city Teancum. Now the city Teancum lay in the borders by the seashore, and it was also near the city desolation. And it was because the armies of the Nephites went up unto the Lamanites, that they began to be smitten. For were it not for that, the Lamanites could have had no power over them. But behold, the judgments of God will overtake the wicked, and it is by the wicked that the wicked are punished. For it is the wicked that stir up the hearts of the children of men unto bloodshed. Under Boyd K. Packer said, Often, very often, we are punished as much by our sins as we are for our sins. Mormon 4, 6-12 and it came to pass that the Lamanites did make preparations to come against the city Teancum. And it came to pass in the three hundred and sixty and fourth year, the Lamanites did come against the city Teancum, that they might take possession of the city Teancum also. And it came to pass that they were repulsed and driven back by the Nephites. And when the Nephites saw that they had driven the Lamanites, they did again boast of their own strength. And they went forth in their own might and took possession again of the city desolation. And now all these things had been done, and there had been thousands slain on both sides, both the Nephites and the Lamanites. And it came to pass that the three hundred and sixty and sixth year had passed away, and the Lamanites came again upon the Nephites to battle. And yet the Nephites repented not of the evil they had done, but persisted in their wickedness continually. And it is impossible for the tongue to describe, or for man to write a perfect description of the horrible scene of the blood and carnage which was among the people, both of the Nephites and of the Lamanites, and every heart was hardened, so that they delighted in the shedding of blood continually. And there never had been so great wickedness among all the children of Lehi, nor even among all the house of Israel, according to the words of the Lord, as were among this people. In a war of vengeance such as that described in Mormon 4, Men lose the spirit of the Lord, and their thirst for bloody retribution. Mormon recorded seeing a horrible scene of blood and carnage, and every heart was hardened, so that they delighted in the shedding of blood continually. This spirit promoted such wickedness never before found among all the children of Lehi, nor even among all the house of Israel, according to the words of the Lord. Elder Charles W. Penrow said, now, if a nation essays to go forth against another nation for the purpose of conquest, to gain territory, to grasp something that does not belong to that nation, then the nation thus assailed has the right to resist even to the shedding of blood, as it was in this land for the war for independence. But we have to be careful as to what spirit we are guided by. We Latter-day Saints must watch ourselves and not give way to passion and desire to shed blood and to destroy, for that is the power of the evil one. There is a very great difference between arising to go forth for conquest, for blood, for plunder, to gain territory and power in the earth, and in fighting to defend our own possessions in the spirit of justice and righteousness and equity, and standing up like men for those things that we have a right to contend for. Mormon explained how the wicked are punished. The Lord merely withdraws and leaves the people to themselves, and the wicked punish one another. 
Compare this with the prophetic comments in 1 Nephi 2.23 and Leviticus 26.25. 1 Nephi 2. For behold, in that day that they shall rebel against me, I will curse them even with a sore curse, and they shall have no power over thy seed, except they shall rebel against me also. Leviticus 26. And I will bring a sword upon you, that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when ye are gathered together within your cities, I will send the pestilence among you, and ye shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. Mormon 4, 13-14 And it came to pass that the Lamanites did take possession of the city desolation, and this because their number did exceed the number of the Nephites. And they did also march forward against the city Teancum, and did drive the inhabitants forth out of her, and did take many prisoners, both women and children, and did offer them up as sacrifices unto their idol gods. The first two commandments in the Decalogue, or the Ten Commandments, forbade the sin of idolatry. Thus the Lord announced the error and sin of having false gods, tangible or intangible, as objects of worship. It is very important to understand that the worship of a false god that is intangible is just as evil and just as disastrous to the idolater as the worship of a graven image. Some false god may be associated with nature or be the worship of nature itself, meaning the laws or powers seen in nature. Though in the Old Testament idolatry is associated with the worship of actual images, true idolatry goes far beyond the practice of bowing down to images and appeasing angry idols. The Lord has made it clear in all ages that whenever men place their full trust in such things as other men, nations, treaties, treasuries, precious minerals, armies, or armaments, their actions are a form of idolatry, because such actions reveal a lack of trust in Jehovah. To be totally free of idolatry, one must put complete trust in the true God. A person's God is the thing or being in which he trusts and which he believes has the greatest power. It is the thing to which he looks for whatever salvation he believes is available. All other beliefs and actions are affected by that belief or object of his worship. When this idea is fully grasped, one can understand why the Lord would issue an edict to destroy all the people and their possessions in an idolatrous city. Not to destroy their goods would be to demonstrate a lack of faith that the Lord would provide. Similarly, if a Latter-day Saint will not tithe, is it not because he centers his trust in worldly things and the system that produces them instead of in the providence of the Lord. In that sense, then, the things of the world become a God to him, for he trusts more in them than in God's power. Paul said, covetousness is idolatry. And a covetous man is an idolater. Is not the failure to pay tithing a form of covetousness? Those who do not pay tithing would likely be shocked to think they were guilty of idolatry, just as the ancient Israelites were guilty of idolatry. The form differs, but the sin is the same. Often modern prophets have warned against making idols of money, automobiles, houses, and other material objects. The worship of these things, of course, is systematic of the trust some have in natural law instead of God in his laws. They see the world as a place where the creature fares according to his genius. Hence, they look upon all they gain as their own, not as the Lord's. They forget that they are only stewards of the Lord's goods. A Zion people can come into being only through obedience to the gospel, commencing with the true knowledge of the true God. There cannot be any compromise. You cannot serve God in mammon. True worship, like liberty, is not divisible. You cannot get away with a little idolatry. Once started, the destruction follows, unless sincere repentance occurs. When the Lord put a blessing and a curse upon the children of Israel and their land, the conditions were very strict. The Israelites failed because they would not put their complete trust in their one true God. So they were delivered up to the consequences of trying to love both the world and the Lord at the same time. Brigham Young called upon modern saints to examine their own hearts in this regard. Again, I can charge you with what you will all plead guilty of. If you would confess the truth, you dare not quite give up all your hearts to God and become sanctified throughout and be led by the Holy Ghost from morning until evening and from one year's end to another. 
I know this is so, and yet few will acknowledge it. I know this feeling is in your hearts as well as I know the sun shines. We will examine it a little closer. Many of you have fearful forebodings that all is not right in the organization of this kingdom. You shiver and shake in your feelings and tremble in your spirit. You cannot put your trust in God, in men, or in yourself. This arises from the power of evil that is so prevalent upon the face of the whole earth. It was given to you by your father and mother. It was mingled with your conception in the womb, and it has ripened in your flesh, in your blood, and in your bones, so that it has become riveted in your very nature. If I were to ask you individually if you wish to be sanctified throughout and become as pure and holy as you possibly could live, every person would say yes. But if the Lord Almighty should give a revelation instructing you to be given wholly up to him and to his cause, you would shrink, saying, I am afraid he will take away some of my darlings. That is the difficulty with the majority of this. It is for you and I to wage war with that principle until it is overcome in us. Then we shall not entail it upon our children. It is for us to lay a foundation so that everything our children have to do with, we bring them to Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than the blood of Abel. If we lay such a foundation with all good conscience and labor as faithfully as we can, it will be well with us and our children in time and in eternity. Mormon 4, 15-23 And it came to pass that in the three hundred and sixty and seventh year, the Nephites being angry because the Lamanites had sacrificed their women and their children, that they did go up against the Lamanites with exceedingly great anger, insomuch that they did beat again the Lamanites and drive them out of their lands. And the Lamanites did not come again against the Nephites until the three hundred and seventy and fifth year. And in this year they did come down against the Nephites with all their powers, and they were not numbered because of the greatness of their number. And from this time forth did the Nephites gain no power over the Lamanites, but began to be swept off by them, even as a dew before the sun. And it came to pass that the Lamanites did come down against the city of Desolation, and there was an exceedingly sore battle fought in the land Desolation, in the which they did beat the Nephites. And they fled again from before them, and they came to the city Boaz, and there, and there they did stand against the Lamanites with exceeding boldness, insomuch that the Lamanites did not beat them until they had come again the second time. And when they had come the second time, the Nephites were driven and slaughtered with an exceedingly great slaughter. Their women and their children were again sacrificed unto idols. And it came to pass that the Nephites did again flee from before them, taking all the inhabitants with them, both in towns and villages. And now I, Mormon, seeing that the Lamanites were about to overthrow the land, therefore I did go to the hill Shim, and did take up all the records which Amaron had hid up unto the Lord. The Nephites did go up with their armies to battle against the Lamanites. And the armies of the Nephites were driven back. There were thousands slain on both sides. And yet the Nephites repented not, but persisted in their wickedness. And from this time forth they did gain no power over the Lamanites, but began to be swept off by them, even as a dew before the sun. And now, seeing that the Lamanites were about to overthrow the land, I did go to the hill Shim, and did take up all the records which Amaron had hid up unto the Lord. Amaron told Mormon to take the large plates of Nephi from the hill Shim and add to them. Mormon was to leave the rest of the plates, plates of brass, small plates of Nephi, and plates of ether in the hill Shim. Mormon removed the large plates, wrote a full account of the activities of his people on them, and used a selected portion of them to create his own condensed and abridged history of his people. Later, Mormon returned to the hill Shim and removed all of the plates.
plates of brass, small plates of Nephi, plates of ether, and all other plates from the hill. Fearing that the Lamanites might destroy the records, Mormon hid the plates again, except his abridgment and the small plates of Nephi, the gold plates in the hill Cumorah. These gold plates Mormon gave to his son Moroni. Chapter 5 Mormon again leads the Nephite armies in battles of blood and carnage. The Book of Mormon will come forth to convince all Israel that Jesus is the Christ. Because of their unbelief, the Lamanites will be scattered, and the Spirit will cease to strive with them. They will receive the gospel from the Gentiles in the latter days. About 375 to 384 A.D. Mormon again leads the Nephites into battle, but it is without hope for their success. Mormon 5, 1-2 And it came to pass that I did go forth among the Nephites, and did repent of the oath which I had made, that I would no more assist them. And they gave me command again of their armies, for they looked upon me as though I could deliver them from their afflictions. But behold, I was without hope, for I knew the judgments of the Lord, which should come upon them. For they repented not of their iniquities, but did struggle for their lives without calling upon that being who created them. I feel our people need you. They look unto me as though I and deliver them from their afflictions. Mormon, you have always loved them. And I know, I know you would die for them. I did go forth among the Nephites, and did repent of the oath which I had made that I would no more assist them. But I was without hope, for I knew the judgments of the Lord which should come upon them, for they repented not of their iniquities, but did struggle for their lives without calling upon the being who created them. Mormon, like Captain Moroni, had no joy and found no glory in war. What do you think would have influenced Mormon to repent of his oath and assume command of the Nephite armies once again? Did he have any hope of victory? Why not? In this crucible of weakness, the true greatness of Mormon shines like a star as he calls his son to action, telling him that no matter how bad things are, we must never stop trying to do what we can to improve matters. For if we should cease to labor, we should be brought under condemnation, for we have a labor to perform whilst in this tabernacle of clay. In this spirit, Mormon took over command of the army even when he knew that all was lost. For they looked upon me as though I could deliver them from their afflictions, but behold, I was without hope. This is the predicament of the true, tragic hero. I had led them notwithstanding their wickedness, and had loved them with all my heart, and my soul had been poured out in prayer unto my God all the day long for them. Nevertheless, it was without faith because of the hardness of their hearts. However it might appeal to our own age of violence, Mormon found little consolation in the fact that his people were wonderfully tough and proud of it. For so exceedingly do they anger, that they seem to me that they have no fear of death. They repented not of their iniquities, but did struggle for their lives without calling upon that being who created them. They could take care of themselves, thank you. And they did. Mormon 5, 3-8 through eight. And it came to pass that the Lamanites did come against us, as we had fled to the city of Jordan. But behold, they were driven back, that they did not take the city at that time. 
And it came to pass that they came against us again, and we did maintain the city. And there were also other cities which were maintained by the Nephites, which strongholds did cut them off that they could not get into the country which lay before us to destroy the inhabitants of our land. But it came to pass that whatsoever lands we had passed by, and the inhabitants thereof were not gathered in, or destroyed by the Lamanites, and their towns and villages and cities were burned with fire. And thus three hundred and seventy and nine years passed away. And it came to pass that in the three hundred and eightieth year the Lamanites did come again against us to battle. And we did stand against them boldly. But it was all in vain, for so great were their numbers that they did tread the people of the Nephites under their feet. And it came to pass that we did again take to flight, and those whose flight was swifter than the Lamanites did escape, and those whose flight did not exceed the Lamanites were swept down and destroyed. And now, behold, I, Mormon, do not desire to harrow up the souls of men in casting before them such an awful scene of blood and carnage as was laid before mine eyes. But I, knowing that these things must surely be made known, and that all things which are hid must be revealed upon the housetops. Mormon's record to come forth to invite all to come unto Christ. Mormon 5, 9-14 and also that a knowledge of these things must come unto the remnant of these people, and also unto the Gentiles, who the Lord hath said should scatter this people, and this people should be counted as not among them. Therefore I write a small abridgment, daring not to give a full account of the things which I have seen, because of the commandment which I have received, and also that ye might not have too great sorrow because of the wickedness of this people. And now behold, this I speak unto their seed, and also to the Gentiles, who have care for the house of Israel, that realize and know from whence their blessings come. For I know that such will sorrow for the calamity of the house of Israel. Yea, they will sorrow for the destruction of this people. They will sorrow that this people had not repented, that they might have been clasped in the arms of Jesus. Now these things are written unto the remnant of the house of Jacob, and they are written after this manner, because it is known of God that wickedness will not bring them forth unto them. And they are to be hid up unto the Lord, that they may come forth in his own due time. And this is the commandment which I have received. And behold, they shall come forth according to the commandment of the Lord, when he shall see fit in his wisdom. And behold, they shall go unto the unbelieving of the Jews, and for this intent shall they go, that they may be persuaded that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that the Father may bring about through his most beloved his great and eternal purpose in restoring the Jews, or all the house of Israel, to the land of their inheritance, which the Lord their God hath given them, unto the fulfilling of his covenant. What did Mormon perceive were the main purposes of his record-keeping? Mormon 5.15 And also that the seed of this people may more fully believe his gospel, which shall go forth unto them from the Gentiles. And knowing that a knowledge of these things must come unto the remnant of these people, I write a small abridgment. Now these things are written unto the remnant of the house of Jacob, and they are to be hid up unto the Lord, that they may come forth in his own due time. And they shall go unto the unbelieving, that they may be persuaded that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that the Father may bring about, through His most beloved, His great and eternal purpose in restoring all the house of Israel unto the fulfilling of His covenant. And also that the seed of this people may more fully believe His gospel, And after I had made an abridgment from the plates of Nephi, I searched among the records, and I found these plates. I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents, therefore I make a record of my proceedings, and I know that the record which I make is true. I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded, for I know that the Lord giveth no commandment unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them, that they may accomplish the thing which he commanded them. Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath commanded my husband to flee into the wilderness. 
And I also know of a surety that the Lord hath protected my son. He cometh into the world that he may save all men if they will hearken unto his voice. Reconcile yourselves to the will of God and not to the will of the devil and the flesh. And remember, after ye are reconciled unto God, that it is only in and through the grace of God that ye are saved. And the things which are upon these plates please me because of the prophecies of the coming of Christ. And I shall take these plates and put them with the remainder of my record. And I do this for a wise purpose. For thus it whispereth me, according to the workings of the Spirit of the Lord which is in me. And now, I do not know all things, but the Lord knoweth all things which are to come. Wherefore he worketh in me to do according to his will. Mormon 5.15 continued, For this people shall be scattered, and shall become a dark and filthy, and a loathsome people beyond the description of that which ever hath been among us, yea, even that which hath been among the Lamanites, and this because of their unbelief and idolatry. Mormon knew this record would come forth in the latter days. What did he say are the general purposes of the record's latter-day appearance? Compare Mormon's intentions with those of Moroni as recorded on the title page of the Book of Mormon. He nibbly adds the following possible insight into what the Nephite society may have been like at this time. The Nephites foolishly took the offensive and as a result lost both the land and the city of desolation, and the remainder did flee and join the inhabitants of the city of Teancum. This makes it clear that we are still reading only of Mormon's band of Nephites, and not a history of the whole nation. For the people of Teancum, which was in the borders by the seashore, near the city desolation had up to then taken no part in the fighting. It must always be borne in mind that by this time the Nephite people had become broken up into tribes, each living by itself and following its own tribal laws. So what Mormon gives us is only a sampling of the sort of thing that was going on. Here you have a clear picture of Nephite society, separate lands living their own lives. Now in this last crisis, terribly reluctant to move and join the swelling host in the retreat to the north, those who refused to pull up stakes were one by one completely wiped out by the Lamanites. This was no planned migration, but a forced evacuation. Like dozens of such we read about in the grim and terrible times of the invasion of the barbarians that destroyed the classic civilizations of the Old World. In this case, Mormon's people were only part of the general and gradual evacuation of the whole land. Mormon 5.16 For behold, the Spirit of the Lord hath already ceased to strive with their fathers, and they are without Christ and God in the world, and they are driven about as chaff before the wind. President Harold B. Lee explained that the wicked people of Mormon's time had lost not only the Holy Ghost, but the Spirit of Christ from their lives. Mormon describes some people, his people, from whom the Spirit of the Lord had departed. And when I read that, it seems clear to me that what he was talking about was not merely the inability to have the companionship of, or the gift of the Holy Ghost, but he was talking of that light and truth to which everyone born into the world is entitled, and will never cease to strive with the individuals unless he loses it through his own sinning. Mormon 5.17 They were once a delightsome people, and they had Christ for their shepherd, yea, they were led even by God the Father. Mormon lamented and depraved the condition of his people who, by contrast, had once been delightsome. President Gordon B. Hinckley reflected on some blessings associated with being delightsome and the requirements to achieve such a condition. There is the great blessing of wisdom, of knowledge, even hidden treasures of knowledge. We are promised that ours shall be a delightsome land if we will walk in obedience to this law. I can interpret the word land as people, that those who walk in obedience shall be a delightsome people. What a marvelous condition! to be a delightsome people whom others would describe as blessed. Mormon 5.18 And now behold, they are led about by Satan, even as chaff is driven before the wind, 
or as a vessel is tossed about upon the waves, without sail or anchor, or without anything wherewith to steer her, and even as she is, so are they. Mormon uses two beautiful similes to describe conditions, as he saw them in his day. Similes are verbal expressions which make comparisons between two objects or conditions by use of the words as or like. Can you pick them out? Mormon 5, 19-21 And behold, the Lord hath reserved their blessings, which they might have received in the land, for the Gentiles who shall possess the land. But behold, it shall come to pass that they shall be driven and scattered by the Gentiles. And after they have been driven and scattered by the Gentiles, behold, then will the Lord remember the covenant which he made unto Abraham and unto all the house of Israel. And also the Lord will remember the prayers of the righteous, which have been put up unto him for them. Again, Mormon pauses in his narrative to speak to us. The readers whom he knew would receive his record in the far distant future. Mormon 5, 22-23 O then, O ye Gentiles, how can ye stand before the power of God, except ye shall repent and turn from your evil ways? Know ye not that ye are in the hands of God? Know ye not that he hath all power, and at his great command the earth shall be rolled together as a scroll? What great promises does Mormon make to the Gentiles of the latter days if they will but repent? What do you think it means to be in the hands of God? What can you do to qualify to enjoy more benefits from being in God's hands? Mormon wrote for us in the latter days, admonishing us to recognize God and his power. We are in his hands. Elder W. Craig's Wick of the Seventy explains some symbolism and blessings suggested by being in God's hands. Hands are one of the symbolically expressive parts of the body. In Hebrew, yad, the most common word for hand is also used metaphorically to mean power, strength, and might. Thus, hands signify power and strength. To be in the hands of God would suggest that we are not only under his watchful care, but also that we are guarded and protected by his wondrous power. Throughout the scriptures, reference is made to the hand of the Lord. His divine assistance is evidenced over and over again. His powerful hands created worlds, and yet they were gentle enough to bless the little children. Every one of us needs to know that we can go on in the strength of the Lord. How do we learn to extend our hand and connect to the comfort provided by the Lord? There are four keys. Learn, listen, seek the Spirit, and pray always. The Lord will provide sustenance and support if we are willing to open the door and receive His hand of divine assistance. Imagine the wounds in his hands, his withered hands, yes, even his hands of torn flesh and physical sacrifice, give our own hands great power and direction. It is the wounded Christ who leads us through our moments of difficulty. It is he who bears us up when we need more air to breathe or direction to follow or even more courage to continue. If we will keep the commandments of God and walk in his paths, we will go forward with faith and never feel alone. Mormon 5.24 Therefore repent ye, and humble yourselves before him, lest he shall come out in justice against you, lest a remnant of the seed of Jacob shall go forth among you as a lion, and tear you in pieces, and there is none to deliver. What simile does he employ in verse 24? Of this warning to the Gentiles, Mark E. Peterson said, Can we ignore such a warning directed specifically at this generation? Today is day six for the Come Follow Me study for this week, October 28th through November 3rd. I would that I could persuade all to repent. Mormon 1 through 6. Saturday, November 2nd, 2024. Mormon 6. Mormon saw us. Modern man does not see himself as well as Moroni was able to through the power of God. Chapter 6. The Nephites gather to the land of Cumorah for the final battles. Mormon hides the sacred records in the hill Cumorah. The Lamanites are vicious, and the Nephite nation is destroyed. Hundreds of thousands are slain by the sword, about 385 A.D. Last Battles in the Land of Cumorah 
Mormon 6, 1 through 6. And now I finished my record concerning the destruction of my people, the Nephites. And it came to pass that we did march forth before the Lamanites. And I, Mormon, wrote an epistle unto the king of the Lamanites, and desired of him that he would grant unto us that we might gather together our people unto the land of Cumorah, by a hill which was called Cumorah, and there we could give them battle. And it came to pass that the king of the Lamanites did grant unto me the thing which I desired. And it came to pass that we did march forth to the land of Cumorah, and we did pitch our tents round about the hill Cumorah, and it was in the land of many waters, rivers, and fountains. And here we had hoped to gain advantage over the Lamanites. And when three hundred and eighty and four years had passed away, we had gathered in all the remainder of our people unto the land of Cumorah. And it came to pass that when we had gathered in all our people in one to the land of Cumorah, behold, I, Mormon, began to be old, and knowing it to be the last struggle of my people, and having been commanded of the Lord that I should not suffer the records which had been handed down by our fathers, which were sacred, to fall into the hands of the Lamanites, for the Lamanites would destroy them. Therefore I made this record out of the plates of Nephi, and hid up in the hill Camor all the records which had been entrusted to me by the hand of the Lord, save it were those few plates which I gave unto my son Moroni. President Joseph Fielding Smith said, it is known that the hill Cumorah, where the Nephites were destroyed, is the hill where the Jaredites were also destroyed. This hill was known to the Jaredites as Rama. It was approximately near to the waters of Ripliancum, which the Book of Mormon says by interpretation is large, or to exceed all. Mormon adds, And it came to pass that we did march forth to the land of Cumorah, and we did pitch our tents round about the hill Cumorah, and it was in a land of many waters, rivers, and fountains. And there we had hope to gain advantage over the Lamanites. It must be conceded that this description fits perfectly to the land of Cumorah in New York, as it has been known since the visitation of Moroni to the prophet Joseph Smith, for the hill is in the proximity of the Great Lakes and also in the land of many waters and fountains. Moreover, the prophet Joseph Smith himself is on record, definitely declaring the present hill called Cumorah to be the exact hill spoken of in the Book of Mormon. Further, the fact that all of his associates from the beginning down have spoken of it as the identical hill where Mormon and Moroni hid the records must carry some weight. It is difficult for a reasonable person to believe that such men as Oliver Cowdery, Brigham Young, Parley P. Pratt, Orson Pratt, David Whitmer, and many others could speak frequently of the spot where the prophet Joseph Smith obtained the plates as the hill Cumorah and not be corrected by the prophet, if that were not the fact that they did speak of this hill in the days of the prophet in this definite manner is an established record of history. President Brigham Young said Oliver Cowdery went with the prophet Joseph when he deposited these plates. When Joseph got the plates, the angel instructed him to carry them back to the hill Camorra, which he did. Oliver says that when Joseph and Oliver went there, the hill opened and they walked into a cave in which there was a large and spacious room. He says he did not think at the time whether they had the light of the sun or artificial light, but that it was just as light as day. They laid the plates on a table. It was a large table that stood in the room. Under this table, there was a pile of plates as much as two feet high, and there were altogether in this room more plates than probably many wagon loads. They were piled up in the corners and along the walls. Mormon 6, 7 through 9. And it came to pass that my people, with their wives and their children, did now behold the armies of the Lamanites marching towards them. And with that awful fear of death, which fills the breasts of all the wicked, did they await to receive them. And it came to pass that they came to battle against us, and every soul was filled with terror because of the greatness of their numbers. And it came to pass that they did fall upon my people with the sword, and with the bow, and with the arrow, and with the axe, and with all manner of weapons of war. And I, Mormon, began to be old, and knowing it to be the last struggle of my people, and having been commanded of the Lord that I should not suffer the records, which were sacred, to fall into the hands of the Lamanites. Therefore I hid up in the hill Cumorah all the records which had been entrusted to me by the hand of the Lord, save it were these few plates which I gave unto my son Moroni. Now I finish my record concerning the destruction of my people. And we gathered in all the remainder of our people into the land of Cumorah. And 
my people, with their wives and their children, did now behold the armies of the Lamanites marching towards them. Mormon 6, 10 through 11. And it came to pass that my men were hewn down, yea, even my ten thousand who were with me, and I fell wounded in the mist. And they passed by me that they did not put an end to my life. And when they had gone through and hewn down all my people, save it were twenty and four of us, among whom was my son Moroni. And we, having survived the dead of our people, did behold on the morrow when the Lamanites had returned unto their camps, from the top of the hill Cumorah, the ten thousand of my people who were hewn down, being led in the front by me. How long did the battle of the hill Cumorah last? The Book of Mormon is not absolutely clear on this point. It states that the battle of Cumorah started when 380 and four years had passed away, that is, 385 AD. After the battle was completed and the Lamanites had killed most of the Nephites, Mormon took the Nephite survivors with them. Mormon took the Nephite survivors with him, and they did behold on the morrow, when the Lamanites had returned unto their camps, the terrible scene of destruction. This could mean on the morrow after the battle was completed, regardless of how long the battle lasted. Note that both Mormon and his son Moroni were among the twenty and four Nephites who survived the last great Nephite-Lamanite conflict. What happened to each of these people is not known. Moroni does inform us later that the Nephites, who had escaped into the country southward, were hunted by the Lamanites until they were all destroyed. These people may have been among those thus killed. For Moroni sadly adds, And my father also was killed by them, and I even remain alone to write the sad tale of the destruction of my people. Later Moroni says, of his solidary state, I make not myself known to the Lamanites, lest they should destroy me. Wherefore, I wander whithersoever I can for the safety of mine own life. Mormon 6, 12-15, And he also beheld the ten thousand of my people who were led by my son Moroni. And behold, the ten thousand of gid had fallen, and he also in the mist. And Lema had fallen with his ten thousand, and Gilgal had fallen with his ten thousand, and Limha had fallen with his ten thousand, and Januam had fallen with his ten thousand, and Kumaniha and Moroniha, and Antionum, and Shiblon, and Shurn, and Josh had fallen with their ten thousand each. And it came to pass that there were ten more who had fallen by the sword with their ten thousand each. Yea, even all my people, save it were those twenty and four who were with me, and also a few who had escaped into the south countries, and a few who had deserted over to the Lamanites had fallen, and their flesh and bones and blood lay upon the face of the earth. 
being left by the hands of those who slew them to molder upon the land and to crumble and to return to their mother earth. In Mormon 6, 10-15, Mormon recorded the number of dead in terms of his military leaders, each of whom commanded 10,000 men. What was the minimum number of people killed? The scene of carnage must have been one of inexpressible horror. Mormon's Lamentation How could ye have rejected that Jesus? Mormon 6, 16-20 and my soul was rent with anguish because of the slain of my people. And I cried, O ye fair ones, how could ye have departed from the ways of the Lord? O ye fair ones, how could ye have rejected that Jesus who stood with open arms to receive you? Behold, if ye had not done this, ye would not have fallen. But behold, ye are fallen, and I mourn your loss. O ye fair sons and daughters, ye fathers and mothers, ye husbands and wives, Ye fair ones, how is it that ye could have fallen? But behold, ye are gone, and my sorrows cannot bring your return. What insight do you gain about Mormon from these verses? How can we incorporate some of these attributes in our own lives? Mormon six twenty one through 22 and the day soon cometh that your mortal must put on immortality. And these bodies which are now moldering in corruption must soon become incorruptible bodies. And then ye must stand before the judgment seat of Christ to be judged according to your works. And if it so be that ye are righteous, then are ye blessed with your fathers who have gone before you. Oh, that ye had repented before this great destruction had come upon you. But behold, ye are gone. And the Father, yea, the eternal Father of heaven, knoweth your state, and he doeth with you according to his justice and mercy. O oh, ye fair ones, how could ye have departed from the ways of the Lord? How could ye have rejected that Jesus, who stood with open arms to receive you? If ye had not done this, ye would not have fallen. But ye are fallen, and I mourn your loss. O oh, ye fair sons and daughters, ye fathers and mothers, ye husbands and wives, how is it that ye could have fallen? Oh, that ye had repented before this great destruction had come upon you. But behold, Ye are gone. What is Mormon mourning in Mormon 6, 16 through 22? Is it simply death? Death itself is part of God's plan and can be a blessing. If the people of Ammon did not look upon death with any degree of terror because of their hope in Christ and the resurrection, neither would Mormon. The people of Mormon were, however, justifiably terrified by death. Why? Alma 28, and the bodies of many thousands are laid low in the earth, while the bodies of many thousands are moldering in heaps upon the face of the earth. Yea, and many thousands are mourning for the loss of their kindred, because they have reason to fear, according to the promises of the Lord, 
that they are consigned to a state of endless woe. Doctrine and Covenants 42 And they that die not in me, woe unto them, for their death is bitter. What one thing could have prevented this great destruction? Mormon's lament as he viewed the slaughtered dead from the top of the hill Cumorah is one of those beautiful and moving pieces of literature found so often written by inspired men of God. Mormon mourned the death of his unrepentant people and sorrowed that they did not change their ways before their lives ended. If they had set aside their pride and repented of their sins, Mormon taught that their reunion with the Savior would have been joyful. We, too, must prepare ourselves to stand before the Lord at the judgment. President James E. Faust explained, We long for the ultimate blessing of the Atonement, to become one with Him, to be in His divine presence, to be called individually by name. How gloriously sublime this experience will be if we can feel worthy enough to be in His presence. The free gift of his great atoning sacrifice for each of us is the only way we can be exalted enough to stand before him and see him face to face. The evil influence of Satan would destroy any hope we have in overcoming our mistakes. He would have us feel that we are lost and that there is no hope. Through our repentance and the gift of the atonement, we can prepare to be worthy to stand in his presence. What other verses in Mormon 1-6 through highlight Mormon's faith in Jesus Christ? What opportunities was he given because he chose to stay faithful? Consider studying President Thomas S. Monson's message, Be an Example and a Light, looking for reasons why it is important for followers of Jesus Christ to stand out or be different. How would you complete sentences like these? Blank was an example to me when he or she blank. This helped me want to blank. Mormon could have felt that his example wasn't making a difference with his people. If you had a chance to talk to Mormon, what would you tell him about how his example has made a difference for you? President Ezra Taft Benson taught that in the Book of Mormon we find a pattern for preparing for the Second Coming. Mormon and Moroni supplied the epilogue to the Book of Mormon, the son drawing freely on his father's notes and letters, the picture that these two paint of their world, which in their minds was a significant resemblance of our own, is one of unrelieved gloom. The situation is unbelievably bad, and in view of the way things are going, quite without hope. The scenes of horror and violence culminating in the sickening escalation of atrocities by Lamanites and Nephites in the ninth chapter of Moroni need no news photographs to make their message convincing to the modern world. The Nephites, like the great heroes of tragedy, Oedipus, Macbeth, Achilles, as they approach their end, are hopelessly trapped by a desperate mentality in which the suppressed awareness of their own sins finds paranoid expression in a mad, ungovernable hatred of others. They have lost their love, one towards another, and they thirst after blood and revenge continually. Their awful guilt leaps out in their instant resentment of any criticism of themselves. When I speak the word of God with sharpness, they tremble in anger against me. They have reached the point of suicidal defiance, which the Greeks called ate, the point of no return. When the sinner, with a sort of fatal fascination, does everything that is most calculated to hasten his own removal from the scene, he is finished, and now all that remains is to him to get out of the way. O oh, my beloved son, how can a people like this, that are without civilization, expect that God will stay his hand? Nephite civilization was thus not extinguished at Cumorah. It had already ceased to exist for some time before the final house cleaning. War had become the order of the day, and every heart was hardened. With the military requisitioning the necessaries of life and leaving the non-combatants to faint by the way and die. Oh, the depravity of my people, cries Mormon, and he tells us in what this depravity consists. They are without order and without mercy. They have become strong in their perversions, and they are alike, brutal, 
sparing none, neither young nor old, and the suffering of our women and our children upon all the face of this land doth exceed everything. Thou knowest that they are without principle and past feeling. I cannot recommend them unto God, lest he should smite me. Here, then, is the real calamity that befell the Nephites in all its tragic horror, and there is no mention whatever of enemy action or of anyone belonging to the wrong party. The ultimate catastrophe is not that people are struck down, that they should be found in any circumstances whatever without order and without mercy, without principle and past feeling. The Book of Mormon speaks of a time when one must repent or he cannot be saved, and also of a time of crisis in which one is no longer able to repent and turn to God. It also says that it can get everlastingly too late. Mormon saw that the day of grace was past for his people. They had no power or desire to repent. Was this because God refused to allow them to repent, or because they, through their willful and tenacious stubbornness, had lost the power? Had they, through their own willfulness, reached the point of Ate, from which they cannot now return? It may be so. The Nephites seemed to prove the point. They went beyond the brink of repentable sin and lost the power or the will to change, not because God would not receive them back, but because sinning was their whole mode of life. We must not let this happen to us. When Mormon says that a man being evil cannot do that which is good, neither will he give a good gift, he really means it. True, awful is the state of man, only if faith has ceased, but faith has ceased. If men insist that there is no redemption, then sure enough, they are as though there had been no redemption made. If these things have ceased, says Moroni, speaking of gifts of the Spirit, will be unto the children of men, for it is because of unbelief, and all is vain. This is no mere figure of speech. If faith fulfills its own prophecies, so does unbelief. And those who insist that all is vain are quite right. If men reject the gospel, they will find everywhere powerful confirmation of their unbelief, and undeniable evidence to support their contention that the human predicament is hopeless. Does God cease to do miracles? Indeed, he does. And the reason why he ceases to do miracles among the children of men is because that they dwindle in unbelief. Anyone who says there are no miracles, therefore, can quote Mormon to prove that he is right. He ceaseth to do miracles. Neither Mormon nor Moroni see the slightest hope of the human race ever pulling itself up by its own bootstraps. And thus far, their message is in the bleak idiom of our own day. Elder Joseph Fielding Smith explained why we must study these prophecies, which in many ways may be unpleasant. I know these are unpleasant things. It is not a pleasant thing even for me to stand here and tell you that this is written in the scriptures. If the Lord has a controversy with the nations, he will put them to the sword. Their bodies shall lie unburied like dung upon the earth. That is not nice, is it? But should we not know it? Is it not our duty to read these things and understand them? Don't you think the Lord has given us these things that we might know, and we might prepare ourselves through humility, through repentance, through faith, that we might escape from these dreadful conditions that are portrayed by these ancient prophets? And that is the key. We can escape through learning the lesson of the Nephite downfall. Rebellion brings destruction. Repentance and righteousness bring divine protection. Elder Orson Pratt explained, But what shall become of this people? Shall we be swept off in the general ruin? Shall desolation come upon us? Shall we feel the chastening hand of the Almighty like those who will not repent? That will depend altogether upon our conduct. We have it within our power. God has granted it to us to save ourselves from the desolation and calamities that will come upon the nation. How? By doing that which is right. By living honest before God and all men by seeking after that righteousness that comes through the gospel of the Son of God, by following after the law of heaven, by doing unto others as we would have others do unto us, by putting away all the evils and abominations that are practiced by the wicked. If we do this, prosperity will be upon the inhabitants. Prosperity will be upon the towns and cities erected by this people. The Lord will be over us to sustain us, and we will spread forth. He will multiply us in the land. He will make us a great people and strengthen our borders and send forth the missionaries of this people 
to the four quarters of the earth to publish peace and glad tidings of great joy and proclaim that there is still a place left in the heart of the American continent where there are peace and safety and refuge from the storms, desolations, and tribulations coming upon the wicked. Jedediah M. Grant said, Why is it that the Latter-day Saints are perfectly calm and serene among all the convulsions of the earth? The turmoils, strife, war, pestilence, famine, and distress of nations? It is because the spirit of prophecy has made known to us that such things would actually transpire upon the earth. We understand it and view it in its true light. We have learned it by the visions of the Almighty. Elder Orson Pratt said, But the Latter-day Saints are not in darkness. They are the children of light, although many of us will actually be asleep. We shall have to wake up and trim our lamps, or we shall not be prepared to enter in. For we shall all slumber and sleep in that day, and some will have gone to sleep from which they will not awake until they awake up in darkness without any oil in their lamps. But as a general thing, the saints will understand the signs of the times, if they do lie down and get to sleep. Others have their eyes closed upon the prophecies of the ancient prophets, and not only that, they are void of the spirit of prophecy themselves. The prophet Joseph Smith said, if they do not understand the signs of the times and the spirit of prophecy, they would be apt to be lost. Elder Orson Pratt said, when a man has this, though he may appeal to ancient prophets to get understanding on some subjects he does not clearly understand, yet, as he has the spirit of prophecy in himself, he will not be in darkness. He will have a knowledge of the signs of the times. He will have a knowledge of the house of Israel and of Zion, of the ten tribes, and of many things and purposes and events that are to take place on the earth. And he will see coming events and can say such an event will take place, and after that another, and then another, and after that the trump will sound, and after that certain things will take place, and then another trump shall sound, etc., etc. And he will have his eye fixed on the signs of the times, and that day will not overtake him unawares, but upon the nations it will come as a thief. The day is at hand, the morning has broken, the sun of the gospel has arisen in the eastern horizon, and is beginning to shine with a degree of splendor. The time is near, how near no man knoweth, the day and the hour when the Son of Man shall come is a secret. In a revelation given to this church, it is said that no man shall know until he comes. Therefore, we cannot expect to know the day nor the hour, but we know it is near at hand, and what a consolation it is. There may be men that will know within a year, that will have revelation to say, within one or two years, when the Lord shall appear. I do not know that there is anything against this. Doctrine and Covenants 106. And again, verily I say unto you, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, and it overtaketh the world as a thief in the night. Therefore gird up your loins, that you may be the children of light, and that day shall not overtake you as a thief. 1 Thessalonians 5. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then suddenly destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Elder Orson Pratt, what condition do you suppose the wicked will be in in those days, even all the inhabitants of the earth except Zion? For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. What a difference between Zion and the rest of mankind, darkness covering the whole four quarters of the globe. Why darkness? Because the salt of the earth is gathered out. The children of light are gathered together to Zion. And those who are left behind are in darkness, that is, a great many of them. No doubt there will be honest ones in vast numbers who will come to Zion, notwithstanding the darkness that covers the earth. President Ezra Taft Benson said, By the light of this spirit, received through the administration of the ordinances, by the power and authority of the holy apostleship and priesthood, you will be enabled to understand and to be the children of light. 
and thus be prepared to escape all the things that are coming on the earth, and so stand before the Son of Man.